Today's episode is brought to you by Applaudable.net. Uh, in 2007, I had a chance to watch Kobe go through one of his private workouts, and I just remember being blown away at how basic the drills he was doing. He was doing basic pivoting drills, basic ball handling and offensive move drills. And at the time, I mean, Kobe was the best player on the planet. And I just was shocked to see somebody at his level doing drills that I had done with middle school and high school age players. And when I asked him why he was doing such basic drills, he basically said, well, that's the reason I'm so good is I don't get bored with the basics. As I said at the opening of this show that I thank you for your time because it is our most valuable resource. Yeah, well, and what I think, and I'm so glad that you went that direction. Um, I do believe that especially young people today, they have more distractions than we've ever had in, in, in mankind. So uh, I think that's the reason it's harder for them to potentially block out distractions and stay focused in the present moment and manage their time more effectively is there's so many different options. I mean, uh, I'm 44 years old, born and raised here in the United States. When I was a child, when I was the age of my children now, we only had like three or four TV channels. Mm -hmm. That was it. I mean, there weren't a lot of options. And, you know, and even things like Atari and Nintendo didn't come around until I was a little bit older, which meant I didn't have very many distractions. I could go out and ride my bike. I could go out and play a sport. I could go out and climb a tree. Uh, I could read a book or I could watch whatever was on three or four TV channels. And really all that was on was kind of the evening news and the morning news and then a couple of shows at night. There really wasn't even anything during the day. So you compare that to today where most children uh, have a tablet or a phone. Uh, TV's got hundreds of channels. The internet is, is endless as far as options of what you can look and find. You know, there's so many more things to distract people today. And that's why, like you said, uh, not only time, but our attention in the present moment is the most valuable thing that we have and the most valuable thing we can give someone. And that's become increasingly more valuable because it's harder to get. It's harder to get someone's focused attention. You know, I'm, I'm very grateful that you're respectful and appreciative of my time, but I'm very respectful and appreciative of yours and your listeners time which is why you have my full undivided attention right now. I mean, mm. you can clearly see me on video. I'm, I'm not checking email. I'm not looking at my phone. I'm not folding laundry. I'm not doing anything but giving you my full undivided attention uh, because I believe you and your listeners deserve that. And, uh, but that's not the way the world's working. Many people are trying to do two or three or four things at once. You know, I see it all the time, even driving. People are dri I've seen people, of course, we've all seen people on their phones when they're driving. I've seen people reading the paper when they're driving. Mm. I've seen somebody shaving when they're driving. Uh, not a, a straight razor, but an electrical. Yeah. I've seen women put on lipstick when they're driving. It's like, my goodness, uh, just focus on one thing at a time. And that's, for me, one of my major focal points is I'm continuing to try to get better at giving everything I'm doing the exact same focus and attention that I'm giving you and your listeners right now. Uh, but I readily admit, as basic as that premise is, it is really hard to do. It is not easy to be fully invested in the present moment. Uh, so I, I have empathy for younger people because they're growing up in a generation that doesn't know any different. Hmm. I, I look at the cons what concerns me is productivity and the ability to be productive. And I think from a business standpoint, it, it could affect the productivity of what we're doing down the track. Because if people cannot do this concept of deep work and long periods of time without distraction, then, then the quality of the work and the quantity will will actually be affected. In in my opinion, absolutely. I think the next generation we we may not see that for another five to ten years, but I do think it's going to play a role in the performance of companies if if they, that situation of distraction isn't addressed. Well, and this is I actually think this is uh, all right. Maybe it's not a good thing for mankind and for society, but if I was. Uh, if I was the CEO of an organization, I would actually be glad that's the way the world's headed because I know that I could make that a competitive advantage for my company. That we could be, we could have such high standards for being in the present moment and creating relationships and face to face contact and blocking out distractions. That could actually be one of our competitive advantages. Mm. That I believe that if we focused on those things, we could be more productive 
than our competition because they're not going to be focused on those things, as you just mentioned. And it will be very interesting to see that battle between everything becoming automated and, and digitized versus our human beings becoming less productive. But I love the fact that the world moves towards automation because that means little customized touch points. Something as simple as a handwritten note is more valuable today than it's ever been mm. um, because no one's doing it anymore. So if I owned a company and I had 100 people that were on my team, I would be talking about this stuff relentlessly. Like I wouldn't even need to tell people, uh, turn off your phones when you get into the meeting or put them in this box. That would be so built into our fabric, they would just know that. They would just leave their phones at their desk when they came in for the meeting because they know that's something that is really important. And if it's important, I'm going to emphasize it daily and we're going to hold each other accountable for that. So if you happen to be the one guy that brings your phone to the meeting, everyone's mm. going to be looking at you with a crooked eye as opposed to the opposite, which is everyone has their phone. And now the one guy that doesn't, people are like, what's wrong with him? So I, I think productivity, human productivity could be a major separator if folks really start to embrace these concepts and focus on them now. And no matter what happens, I know that we will move towards a, a, a more technologically savvy environment, that we will move towards more automation, digitization. But bottom line is your coworkers and colleagues will always be human beings and your clients and customers will always be human beings. So as long as that's true, then relationships and the way we interact and the way we pay attention to human beings is always going to be uh, or should be a part of a company's secret sauce. Hmm. You talk in keynotes and things about this concept of a performance gap. So I'd like to bring that up uh, so that the audience come to understand what that is. So do you want to give a bit of uh, background and, and just a conversation around this performance gap that you speak of in your trainings and be, be happy to. Yeah, a performance gap is simply the gap between what we know and what we do. It's the gap between what all of us know intellectually, intuitively, and know what we should be doing, and then how do we actually behave and what are we doing. So we used that example earlier. A team with a, a very poor culture has a, a huge gap between what they say they believe and how they behave. And we all have performance gaps. Even the highest performers in the world aren't immune to them. Uh, but the highest performers in the world have found ways to mitigate them or eliminate them, at least in the most pressing areas. Uh, perfect example. You know, I, I have the full humility to acknowledge that most of what I share is incredibly basic. Now, none of this stuff is easy. And that's one thing that's really important for people to know. Basic and easy are not synonyms. Mm -hmm. They do not mean the same thing. People often treat them as if they're interchangeable, but they're not. Um, I have 10 year old twin sons and an eight year old daughter. They would have understood if they listen to this podcast and I might make them do so, they'll understand every word of it. There's not anything on here that will confuse them. And they're only eight and 10 years old, but nothing that I've said so far is easy to do. And, and I can even say the same thing for your audience. I don't think that I've shared anything so far that, that your listeners haven't already heard before or don't already know, but that's not the important question to ask. The most important question to ask is, am I doing this stuff? Okay, so I heard Craig say this. Yeah, I know that. Uh, I heard Alan say this. Yeah, I know that. Well, it's okay that you know it, but are you doing it? Because if you're not doing it, then it really doesn't matter. You know, it, 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 just knowing without doing is completely useless. It's no different than that book on your shelf that you haven't read. That thing's doing nothing to help you out. And to take it even one step further, and this is what a lot of people actually make the mistake of, they do read the book but then they don't put any of the stuff into action. And mm. once again, it's almost as if you, you could have just not read the book if you're not gonna act on any of it. You know, I tell people all of the time, and I, I know that it's, there's a dramatic feel to it, and I do that intentionally. I say, look, if you read my, my book, Raise Your Game, if you read it, it'll do absolutely nothing for you, nothing. Mm -hmm. If you read my book and put it into action, it may change your life. It may change a couple of your, your key habits. It might be just what you need to create a breakthrough. So just reading the book by itself will do nothing. Reading the book and actually implementing stuff could change everything for you. And that is the difference of what creates a, a performance gap, knowing and doing. Hmm. 
that's that's very insightful I, I like that concept of the performance gap because we do it as you say everyone does it to varying degrees within their lives is we know what we should be doing and diet was one of the conversations I've seen you had in the past where we all know we should be eating healthy but we tend to choose not to and it is a choice so that's the other thing about the performance gap is we make the choices of what we want to take on board and action and what we just want to know and that, that's yeah that's something that's... Well, and, and, and if we even take it a step further, I mean, because of the internet and, and the stuff that we've talked about, knowledge is at an all-time high. In fact, I don't know that there's anything from a knowledge standpoint that if you and I don't know it, that we can't find it in a matter of seconds by just typing it into Google. Mm. So uh, not knowing is very rarely the, the, the reason people get straight at anymore. Uh, it's the not doing. You know, even not, not only does everyone know that they should eat healthy, if you ask people to write down a list of the healthiest foods they know of, they could list 30 foods immediately. You, and, and you'd see a lot of the same foods. People would start writing down, you know, blueberries and spinach and avocado. And, you know, uh, they would know what foods are healthy. But then if you ask them, well, what foods do you actually eat? If, if there's not a lot of crossover, then they have a performance gap. Same thing with sleep. You know, I don't know that there's an adult in the world that doesn't know that sleep is important, that you should be getting seven, eight, nine hours of quality sleep every night. So people know that that's important. But then if you ask, especially people in the business world, especially entrepreneurs in startup situations, well, how much sleep do you get? It's like, I don't know, two, three hours, sometimes four. It's like, okay, so you know how important sleep is to your critical thinking, to your energy level, to your decision making to your ability to run your company, you know how important that is and you're not doing it. I mean, that's the definition of a performance gap. And it's it, the key to improving performance for anybody is starting to close that gap, is starting to do all of the things that you know you're supposed to do. And what I find really fascinating is we can have them in different areas of our life. So I've spent most of my life around health and fitness and wellness. So I had very narrow performance gaps. Like I work out regularly, I get plenty of quality sleep, I eat healthy foods. That just comes very naturally for me. But then I've looked at other areas of my life and there have been times where, let's say financially, I've had pretty big performance gaps. You know, I knew I was supposed to be saving money, I knew I was supposed to be investing or doing this, and I wasn't doing those things before. And it wasn't because I didn't know, it was simply because I wasn't doing that. One thing that I want to touch on is a concept of infinite games and process and finite games, which Simon Sinek actually speaks to in his talks. Uh, do you see the translation between the people who are in sport that are most successful, that they seem to be constantly evolving and improving and they never reach or have a finishing point? So it's almost like they're playing an infinite game within this concept of a finite game, a game within rules. And do you see that translate to businesses that are successful as well, this concept that they're more focused on the process than their competitors and, and continually improving and evolving to deliver outcomes for their, their customers as opposed to like with sports, it's delivering that outcome for your team, which is winning. Absolutely, yeah, without question. And that's that also parallels kind of Carol Dweck's growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. And you know, I personally believe uh, not only are we more successful when we're continually growing, but we're also happier and more fulfilled. I mean, I, I believe that continual growth and subjecting ourselves to new stuff and developing um, is part of the fuel that drives our passion for whatever that may be. And the best players I've ever been around, they do two things. One, they never leave the basics. So they always work on the fundamentals. That will always be a constant, but then they're always looking to evolve and add something new to their game. Hmm. You know, I know we spoke about, about Kobe earlier. I mean, every off season, he would try to add a new component to his game. Uh, LeBron does the same thing. Michael Jordan used to do the same thing. You know, uh, Kobe hired Hakeem Olajuwon, one of the best uh, centers to ever play the game. One offseason, he hired Hakeem to help him with his post-up game. You know, here he is a guard, uh, but he wanted to be able to add this new dynamic to his game. So he was always adding that. And it's the same is true in business. And this is what's fascinating. If, if all of your competition keeps getting better, and you stay the same, then by, if, by comparison, you're actually getting worse. Mm. You know, you're losing market share or you're losing profit because they're getting better and you're not. 
So uh, even staying the same, you're not really staying the same. You're actually lowering your value to the marketplace because everyone else is getting better. So uh, not only is it more fulfilling and you're, you're happier when you're growing, but it also your, your performance improves, your success and significance improves. So yeah, that self-development, and it always starts with self. You know, I mean, I would tell anyone that's a part of any organization or team, the very first step to improving this team is improving yourself. If you want us to have a better, you know, year this year as a company, then you need to be better this year. You know, if you want us to grow and improve, then you need to grow and improve. So you might only be one of a hundred people in our organization, but if you're not developing and leveling yourself up, then then you're you're sandbagging. You're basically an anchor. You're weighing the rest of us down. And if all hundred people commit to getting more mastery of their craft and developing new skill sets and getting better at what they're doing and constantly evolving, if everyone's doing that, then the company will get better by default. Nothing else mm. is even possible. Is that a cultural thing that maybe that's a corporate responsibility as well? Does the concept of people growing threaten poor organizations where they're worried about people growing and leaving an organization and that's a bad culture to have if you're worried that good people will leave it, it sort of says something about your organization if you're worried about that so so how do you say to a company growth is important and you want your your people to be progressing and getting better and better and yes that may mean they'll leave but it also may mean because you're looking after them they'll stay Absolute man, you, you just dug into some really great stuff there. Uh, kind of two angles that we can look at. Uh, one, yes, the best organizations that I've ever been a part of are constantly investing in their people. They realize that paying for professional development, whether it's bringing in a speaker or ordering a book or paying for a course or sending their team to a conference, they understand that that's a quality investment. I mean, the, and first of all, it's the right thing to do. Um, second of all, it will keep your people motivated as we've already discussed that if I'm constantly paying for new opportunities for you because you work at my company, that's going to keep your passion at an all time high. And the higher your passion is, the better your productivity will be. So it's actually good for the company to keep the fires lit of the people that work there. Uh, but then if you want to talk about a return on your investment, you know, uh, Craig, you've been crushing it this past month. You've done an awesome job. Well, I could give you $500 in cash and you just go spend that however you want, or I can pay for a $500 online course for you to take. It's the same money coming off of my bottom line, but one of them, the company's gonna reap a benefit because now you're going to be a more engaged coworker or colleague, and you're gonna learn new skill sets from this online course that you can now apply to help the rest of us get better, or I can just give you $500 and let you spend it on whatever you want. So it's not even like I have to invest more money I just have to make sure that I'm investing it in the right things. And the, the whole concept of, well, we don't want good people to leave, uh, there's a couple things. One, and I cannot remember for the life of me who originally said this, but it definitely was not me, said something like, the only thing worse than paying you know, for development for your people to get really good and leave is not paying for it, and they suck and they stay. Mm. It's like, oh gosh, well that's not that's... a good thing either. Yeah. Um, and, and what I would constantly be reminding myself is, I want to keep developing my people for the reasons I just stated, but I also want to show them so much appreciation and I want them to know how much I value them that they don't want to leave, that they love being here. And part of that is that I keep giving them, I mean, promotion doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a promotion, but I keep creating opportunities for them to be a part of this culture that they might not be able to get anywhere else. And if and when they grow to a point where they've outgrown their role and I don't have anything else for them, then I should want them to go somewhere else. Like the humanity mm. in me should want to wish them well and write a great endorsement for them to go somewhere else. You know, I, uh, the way that the world changes, if I owned a company, you know, I don't know that I want a hundred people working uh, on my team that are all completely content with just being here. Like I want someone that says, Alan, you know what? I look forward to working for you and learning from you for the next five years. And I'm going to go off and start my own business uh, right with that. Because mm. that means for, for five years, I'm going to have somebody that is very passionate, very motivated, someone that's going to be committed to getting us to be really good so that he or she can then go off and do their own thing. Uh, I, I don't believe you should lead through fear. I don't think you should be leading through pressure and trying to keep people. Um, one of the most fulfilling things that I always saw in basketball was a head coach 
when one of the assistant coaches would leave and take a head coach job somewhere else and how proud the head coach was that one of their, and I say underlings, not in a mm. bad way, but one of their underlings went on to take on a job on their own. Like that's a, that's a feather in your cap. That's a great thing. So uh, to me, you should pour into your people. You should equip them with skills and opportunities that they feel great about where they are. Um, and you should appreciate them so much that they don't want to leave. But if and when it's actually on, you know, in their best interest to leave, they do so in the right way and you support them and encourage them. I just believe that's the, a code of conduct all of us should be living by. Mm. Steve Jobs had this concept of A, a plus and A employees. And he basically said a lot of organizations and a lot of, you know, people pick people who are B and C, what, like rating them. He used ratings and he said he wanted to pick A plus people. He wanted to pick people better than himself. And he, yeah. he, he basically said if your organization's picking people because you're feeling threatened, that if you get someone too good that you might be out of a job, then you, you're in the wrong business because business is about Absolutely. being the best. And sport would be the same. I'm, I wouldn't think that there's not a team on the planet in sport where it doesn't want the best players and the best team players to win. Well, and what's interesting, especially in sport, is, of course, the coaches want to get the best players. But when you've really created a special atmosphere is when the players also want you to get the best players. Mm. You know, if I'm the starting point guard and I know you're recruiting another really good point guard, it takes a lot of courage and, and humility and confidence on my end to encourage that. Uh, because two things. One, I can say, all right, well, if you do recruit this other point guard, uh, I'm going to have to raise my game in order to keep my starting position. So bringing in this other good player is actually going to make me better because now I have to compete. And that's the mindset of a champion. And then the other mindset is simply, well, the more great players I can surround myself with, the better we'll be. And in team sports, uh, winning should be the most important part. Once you get, I'm not talking about youth levels, but once you get to high school and college and pro, winning should be what's most important. So a, a mediocre player would say, you know, I want to be the top dog. I want to be the best player in the leading score. So I don't want our coach to recruit other good players. I want to be the man, even if we don't win very much. Whereas a champion says, I want you to get the best players possible. And even if that means I don't play as much as I'd like, or I don't get to shoot as much as I'd like, we're going to win a championship. And I'm going to be a part of something bigger than myself that's really special. And, and those, are, those are hard to find because I do believe – Things like jealousy and selfishness, they're, they're wired in our DNA. They're inherent. Mm. You know, it's normal for a player to want to be the best player and to feel threatened if another good player comes in. So it's really abnormal to be able to step outside of that. But that's why winning championships and being elite level players is not normal. Mm. Now, you also in this conversation have brought up on several occasions this word basic and keeping with the basics and I know that you have a really good story around Kobe Bryant so I know not everyone who listens to my podcast is into basketball but I, I think um, and you also have a good story around Steph Curry and um, free throws so I, I think it would be you know good if you can take an opportunity to to tell those stories and the other thing that you identify as humans we are storytellers and yes. the importance of telling stories to deliver a message and to deliver learning to people. Yeah, well, no, I, I love the way you teed that up. Um, and I think this will be a, a great way to kind of put a bow tie on everything we've talked about. Uh, as a leader, as a communicator, as a speaker, um, in order to change people's behavior or change, actually get them to, to put things into action, they have to remember what it is that we said or what it is that we taught. So we want things to be sticky. And I certainly found that story makes things incredibly sticky. Uh, so no matter what line of work you're in, even if you're a manager and you've got four people that report to you, anytime you can tell a story that has a lesson, it's much more powerful and memorable than just telling them what to do. You know, hey, I want you to do this, this, and this is not near as powerful or as effective as if I tell you a story and the moral of that story is this, this, and this. So uh, I'll give you the abbreviated version of both because uh, certainly folks can, can find them on my website if they want the full story. But uh, in 2007, I had a chance to watch Kobe go through one of his private workouts. And I just remember being blown away at how basic the drills he was doing. He was doing basic pivoting drills, basic ball handling and offensive move drills. 
And at the time, I mean, Kobe was the best player on the planet. And I just was shocked to see somebody at his level doing drills that I had done with middle school and high school age players. And when I asked him why he was doing such basic drills, he basically said, well, that's the reason I'm so good is I don't get bored with the basics. And mm. that was a really pivotal lesson for me. And it's reminded me ever since that the key to being good at anything is never leaving the basics. It's committing to those basics relentlessly, especially during the unseen hours. And really anyone in the business world, you need to start figuring out what are your basics. You know, um, let's just say someone listening to this is in sales. Uh, well, if you're in sales, I'm a huge believer that the ability to actively listen is one of the most important skill sets that in order for you to ask insightful questions and listen to what your prospect has to say, that's one of the most basic components of being good at sales. Well, how, how often are you practicing the skill of listening? You know, as a sales professional, are you always telling people that they should buy your stuff and beating them over the head with features and benefits? Or are you asking questions to see if their prospects a good fit and then listening to their answers? So um, one could make a very compelling argument that listening is one of the basics of being effective in business. And then if it's a basic, then you have to be practicing it regularly. Uh, very similar uh, at that Kobe Academy, I met Steph Curry. He was one of the college counselors there. And what was remarkable about him was he wouldn't leave the workout until he swished five free throws in a row. And anyone that's listening that's ever shot a basketball knows that's a really high standard. To swish five in a row is really, really challenging. And, you know, it's my belief that, that high standards like that are the reason Steph will go down in history as the greatest shooter the game's ever seen. You know, and it's not by accident or luck. It's because he's willing to hold himself to a high standard. And it goes back to the basics. He wasn't doing anything miraculous. He was swishing five free throws. Free throws, one of the most basic shots in basketball outside of a layup or dunk. And he wanted to have mastery over that. So uh, those are two lessons that I think are really important for us to pull from. And I, I know that I use them in my, my life daily. I'm constantly trying to figure out what are the basics that I need to continue to master and what are the standards of excellence that I need to live up to in order to become the man that I want to become and do my very best not to deviate from either. Yeah, they're great stories and also the the amount of words that come up in those stories do teach lessons that, the, you know, you're talking about standards throughout this interview. And I think one of the things I've noticed with the organisations that I've been party to that I've since left that where I didn't feel that I was feeling their culture, if I could put it that way, it was, I felt because they didn't have standards and the accountability that was needed that I felt that, that would make it an organization of fairness. So I think standards yeah. breed a degree of fairness and, and the organization that I run, my sporting one, um, Oswush actually has a statement of standards stolen part in part from the United States men's team from the coach yep. K implemented a couple of seasons ago, which actually came out of a heated conversation, I believe with LeBron who didn't look him in the eye. And, yep, uh, and, he, and he said, this is unacceptable. We're not going to have this culture. So he got the, the players together, gave them ownership of it and said, we are going to establish some standards here. And you've had, you've had an experience with Coach K. So I might finish on this and it comes back to where you're talking about the value of, of a note or the value of a letter. Yes. So I, I, I'll finish on this. I'll let you um, give us a bit of an outro as well. And thank you for your time. But just give us a little bit of the backstory of Coach K and your experience with him. And I appreciate you giving, like I said, your time because it is our most valuable resource. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. You've navigated a really fun conversation. And I can tell you've practiced the basic of active listening because uh, you asked very insightful questions and you came very prepared. So this has been a, a delight for me. Um, uh, Coach K was, was really somebody, especially early in my career, that I... I idolized. I mean, I can't think of a different word. I mean, it was someone I had read all of his books and um, was just blown away by his perspective and the way that he approached building teams. And I had a chance to meet him when I was working at Montrose. And I, I had a 10 minute conversation with him. And it's funny because I don't really remember anything that we said. I wasn't near as present back then as I'd like to believe I am now. Um, but I'll never forget how he made me feel. You know, he had great body language and, and facial expressions and eye contact, and he kept asking me questions. 
he, he made me feel like I was the most important person in the gym, which I really appreciated. And my parents raised me that if somebody goes out of their way to do something nice for you, you handwrite them a thank you note. So I went home that night and I hand wrote Coach K a thank you note that just said, hey, thank you so much for your time today. You have no idea how much it meant to me. I really appreciate you. I'll continue to root and support for you and Duke. And I sent it off in the mail. And uh, three weeks later, to my surprise, I actually got a letter back. Uh, it's actually, hang on, I even have it right here in my office. <laughs> Because it's, it's in my stuff that I travel with, but, you know, I don't know how closely everyone can see. But, I mean, this is one of my most important possessions. It's actually a letter back from Coach K from my original note. Yeah. And he, he basically said the same thing and was thanking me for my time. And I just remember a couple things. One, my guess is it took him maybe 60 seconds to write this note. That's it. Maybe 60 seconds. And, you know, uh, over the course of our life, 60 seconds is a, is a little thing. But this little thing really had a huge impact on me because this little thing is the reason that I'm relentless about returning people's emails and voicemails and phone calls. Uh, because I figure if the winningest coach in the history of college basketball can make the time to return my letter, then you better believe, Craig, I can call you back. You better believe I can I can email you back or return your text message. So this little thing made a huge difference, and I'm a I'm a profound believer in the fact that little things that we do consistently over time can have a huge effect on everyone else. And you know, once again, I use that story to teach a lesson. Uh, to one final thought that you know, when I, I talk about the stickiness, uh, unfortunately, when Kobe passed away, I received hundreds of emails and text messages, many people that I had never met before that just said, hey, I remember you telling that Kobe story at our, you know, when you keynoted our conference six months ago. I didn't even know who Kobe was at the time, but I'll never forget that story. And to me, that's, first of all, that shows what a powerful legacy Kobe had, mm. but it really reaffirmed that telling story can be powerful, that these people remembered something that I had to stay on stage because I told it through the lens of a story of Kobe Bryant and they you know I get notes all the time that say hey man uh, I loved about never get bored with the basics I'm going to teach that to my kids or you know that's going to be something that's added to our wall in our locker room so yeah story is a great way to get those points across and using that story from coach K just remember that that little things done consistently over time make a huge difference hmm. thanks for your time mate I really do appreciate every moment that you've given us today and i will make sure that all of the 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 links to where people can get hold of you and your book go in the description so i wish you all well with your keynotes i think you recently on one of the major speaking websites were seen as one of the top five or six sought after keynote speakers on the on the u.s circuit at the moment and hopefully we'll see you out here in australia sometime Oh, my goodness. I would love that. Coming to Australia has been on my bucket list for a long time, so I would love to make that happen, and, and I appreciate you so much. No worries. Awesome. Thanks, mate. You got it, brother. Thanks for joining us for a basketball conversation. Feel free to start a conversation of your own with other Oswish superfans by commenting below. And I look forward to sharing our next conversation with you soon. I hope you'll join us again sometime. Catch you later.